But today, um, I'm going to be bringing God's Word to you today. And we, we've been in a series called Liberate, and we've just been going through Exodus uh, and just seeing how far we can make it. And so far today, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 14, so somewhere around November, we should finish Exodus. So uh, that's a joke. Um, and so Exodus, the first chapter, week one of the series, we talked about the call of God on Moses. And then the next two weeks, last week and the week before that, we talked about the 10 plagues and how uh, those plagues were not just an attack on the Egyptians for enslaving the Israelites, but they're also an attack on the gods of Egypt and how God was in his power showing that he is the one true God. In fact, um, in I believe it's Exodus 5, 2, uh, Pharaoh goes, who is the Lord? And that really is the question through the beginning of Exodus. Who is God? In all these other gods that they worshiped and all these other things, can we really trust God? And is God God alone? So God kind of proves that through the, the, the 10 plagues. And at the end of that, Pharaoh says, hey, Moses, I don't ever want to see you again. He literally says those words. And Moses goes, deuces, I'm out of town. We're going to take the people of Israel, a couple million of us, and we're getting out. And so that's kind of where we left last week and where we're going to be picking up today in Exodus chapter 14, uh, verses 5 through 9. And so um, I believe I put most of this story on your notes today, but we'll also have it here on the slide. It says, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people. So what does that mean? He, he had told them, get out, of, get out of town, like we're done with you guys. Once they left, he was like, oh no, this isn't good. Like the, our entire economy is going to crash. We were counting on these people to build our cities and our infrastructures. We just lost millions of people and we lost all of our servants and slaves. And it says, they said, what is it that we, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? They're recognizing that. So he made ready his chariot, Pharaoh, the king, and he took a, an army with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with others, officers over all of them. So, so Pharaoh gathers up not just his army, he gathers up his special forces, if you will. He gets 600 chosen. He went through and picked his, his best officers, his most deadly assassins, and said, you guys are the group. I, I need your help. He, he and, and, and brings them in, enlists them in to chase down uh, the Israelites. So this is who he's got chasing them down. He, they're getting ready to, to, to take off after them. It says, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel. So here we have the, the enemy Pharaoh now is pursuing them as they're leaving. While the people of Israel are going out defiantly, the Egyptians pursued them, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them and in, them encamped at the sea. And so uh, the, Pharaoh's army, the people of Israel had been marching and leaving, and it says, so Pharaoh's army comes up behind them, and what this tells us is basically the, is the people of Israel have the sea, the Red Sea in front of them, and they have Pharaoh's army behind them. So in this story, let's get this thing right, the people of God are finally free. Like They've been liberated, they're no longer slaves, they're home free, the promised land is ahead. This thing that God promised to Abraham over 400 years ago, now they're free. Now one of the promises of God to Abraham was that the children of Israel would multiply like the sand on the shore or like the stars in the sky. And now there's millions of them just 400 years later. So part of the, the God's word and promise to them had come true. But the other part was that they would inhabit this land, this chosen land for his people that was full of milk and honey. So here they are. They're on their way to the milk and honey. And, and so, uh, or like in our terms might be the cookies and milk, you know, like whatever it is that you, like that's, that's the wealth, the sweetness, the things that we don't have everywhere, but it's in this chosen land. So they got the thing set on cruise control. Pharaoh's behind them. He's been, they've been defeated. The 10 plagues have crippled the nation. They're on their way out. Not only that, we learned in the story that, that the people of Israel went door to door, and it says that they gave them all of their, like they gave them piles of gold and, and, and wealth and riches, so they left with stuff too. So not only were they slaves and they just got set free, but they got set free and they left with some stuff. So they're on their way out of town, scotch-free, and then whammo. And, and, and I, I feel like when I read this story, like, I feel like that kind of identify, like that's, I can identify with that. Like I've had that happen in my life over and over again, multiple times. 
where I feel like, hey, today's going to be a new day. Like I, I woke up, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, and so this is me, a little confession right here. I woke up two weeks ago and was supposed to start working out with my buddy Ryan and Christian here. And I woke up on Monday morning, had my alarm set for like 5.30 in the morning and was going to get ready and drive and go work out with them. And I was so excited to do that, except for my daughter came and got in our bed about midway through the night. And I didn't realize I didn't sleep all night. I tossed and turned because she likes to sleep sideways and she's like six foot tall and is only seven years old. We grow them big in our house. And, and so I woke up and I was just, I did not sleep well. I was not feeling good. And so I said, like, I had all these intentions. I had my bag packed. I had my little protein shake already packed in my bag, ready to go. Like, I had my mind was set. I was, like, I was already looking forward to feeling better and to getting that habit and that discipline back. And no more did I pack my bag did I not even make it. And, like, I, and that's just a, a fun, silly example, but that happens in our lives where we make these plans and we have these promises and we have these things that are out in front of us and we're so excited, we, we get things kind of going the way that we think that they need to go. The land of milk and honey is ahead, like the promise is ahead, this job, I just got that job I wanted, or just maybe I switched my degrees, I'm be so much more happy with this degree, and then all of a sudden you walk into class and you meet the teacher. Or all of a sudden you meet your new boss. Or all of a sudden you sleep, your daughter comes and gets in the bed and, and doesn't help you sleep and so you don't go work out. Whatever it may be, like we find ourselves in these moments, in these situations where we feel like we've got some hope, but the reality is like there's still stuff that happens. There's still crud that happens. And what do you do when you find yourselves in these situations? Like what do we do when we find ourselves in a situation where we got our past behind us, but our future in front of us is not easy? Like... The future, there's a promise that God has for us, but there's this giant sea in the way. There's an obstacle in the way. What do we do when we're stuck between like a, a rock and a hard place? Like, what do we do in those situations? And everyone knows this to be true because all of us have experienced this, is that hope of a promised land, to have a hope, something that you're working towards, does not negate the fact that we have an enemy that, at hand. So just because we have a hope, just because we have a promise, doesn't mean we're going to get off scotch free. That's not how it works. In fact, many of you, maybe in the room when you first came to know God and maybe you prayed a prayer at a church or maybe you came down to the altar or maybe you had a moment in a car or whatever it may have been, when you decided, I'm going to follow Jesus, I want to know Jesus, and you just thought, man, this is the best decision I've ever made, and so therefore, because it's the best decision I've ever made, I'm about to live the best life I've ever had. And what you didn't realize is just because you've made the best decision you've ever had doesn't mean bad stuff doesn't still happen. And it does. It, like, we still face adversity. There's still an enemy. There's still things in our lives that, that disrupt us from moving forward, that keep, keep us from, from tackling and doing the things that all God's called us to do. Just because we have momentum doesn't mean there's not going to be obstacles. Just because we have passion doesn't mean we're not going to face some pain or some suffering. In fact, we see this, it's happening in our world here today. We've got people, and in, in, in I've seen, and I'm connected with some different missionaries and different things, that there's pastors, there's believers, there's Christians in Afghanistan right now that they literally are praying the prayer, God, give me boldness and courage because I know the time is drawing nigh. Like they, they're literally preparing themselves to die for their faith. And so we know that people face adversity. We can see it. And, and in fact, many of you are probably praying for those people. And, and I think we should. We should pray for that they would have boldness and courage. We should pray that God would protect them. And But we see this. It's happened all throughout the ages. In fact, the disciples, they asked Jesus, what is it that we can do to, to inherit heaven? How can we go to heaven? And one of the things Jesus tells them is take up your cross daily. That doesn't sound fun. Uh, did you, have you read the story about what happened to Jesus on the cross? Jesus said, that's part of your life. So there's, we know there's an enemy. We know there's pain and suffering. But what about the promise? Like, even though we know we have a past and we know there's pain, but what about the promise? What about the thing that's in front of us? How do, what do we do when we find ourselves stuck in between these two worlds? The pain of, of our world and the sin and the fallen nature of it, our past, our mistakes, our burdens, our bondages, and the promise that's ahead of us. What do we do in those situations. In fact, I believe that one of the things we gotta do is we gotta recognize that what we're dealing with is not just stuff, it's not just circumstantial, it's not just situations, it's actually, we have an enemy. First Peter 5, 8, Peter says this, says, be sober-minded, be watchful. 
Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We have an, an enemy. We have someone that's prowling around. And you think about a lion that's prowling, like snuck down to the ground and is crawling through the grass and is just looking for opportunities to strike. And not only that, it comes around roaring like a lion. And I, I watched, and in fact, there's a video that's floating around all over the place right now of this lion roar. I don't know if you guys seen that. It's like floating around every time, maybe because I watched it once, it keeps showing it to me, I don't know. But I saw this on social media, and it's a zoo, and it's like just someone like within a few feet of this lion, and they just like on their phone record this lion roar, and it was like one of those kind of things that when you hear it, you're like, oh, good night. Like you just like, if I was anywhere near that thing, I would just take off running, because it sounded like I'm about to be a buffet, is what it sounded like. That roar was so loud and so like, uh, I don't know the right word to describe it, rich. Like it was so powerful. It was almost scary. It was intimidating. It really was. And, and you, it was funny, right after it roars, this mouth comes, you know, just creaking open, lets out this roar, then it rolls its head back like this and then yawns and lays down. You know, <laughs> it was like that, all of that intimidation, all of that power, all of that vocalization, all of that, 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 that intimidation yeah, it doesn't really have that much power because it's in a cage. And I think that's what the enemy is often trying to do to us. Out there stirring up, making noise. Out there like coming against us and making all this fuck us. But, but the, the reality is it, there's not that much power. In fact, he, he can seek to devour. That's his, his goal and his, his objective. But Luke tells us this, that God has given us the authority to trample on the enemy. And we have the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, to overcome the power of the enemy. But here's the problem. Instead of trampling, too many of us are playing with them. Right, we're finding ourselves just kind of dealing with, with the sin that's around us. We find ourselves dealing with the, the bondages and the frustrations and the, the circumstances and the situations. We see them as just part of life. And so we've gotten comfortable in them. And church, I'm not just talking about the, 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 the world, the people outside of the church that are unholy, the pagans, or whatever the old school term you want to throw. I'm talking about the church here. Like we've wanted to just deal with some things. We've wanted to just live with some things. There's snakes trampling coming around us, and we're just playing with them. We're just like, we're just dancing in the snakes instead of stomping on them. We've, get, we've been given the authority of God to have victory over our enemies, Yet we just learn to deal with things. And church, this has kind of been the whole focus for me in this series is I believe freedom is something as believers we always think of when we think of a uh, freedom, excuse me, when we think of freedom, we always think of the person that's worse than us and how God needs to do something in their life. But how often we think of freedom do we think about ourselves and go, you know what, there's some areas in my life I, I could see God breaking some things off of me. Maybe it's a thought. Maybe, maybe it's a, a pattern of thinking. Maybe it's words that we say. Maybe it's negativity or, or something, something crude or something cursing. or some, some, Maybe it's something that's coming out of our mouth that we know is not quite. Maybe it's a thought. Maybe it's something in our past. Maybe it's something that's been done or something that we have done that just keeps coming up in our lives. Maybe it is something dark. Maybe we do have a habit or an addiction that we just can't seem to shake. But church, I believe for us to, to say that this is a place of freedom, for us to say that this is a place of redemption, for us to say that this is a place for God's grace and for people to come and know him and be set free and made whole and redeemed, for us to say that this is a place, we have to participate in that. We can't be over here saying, come see this, come see this, and we're just holding a portion or a piece of it. We've got to immerse ourselves in the power of God. We've got to immerse ourselves in the presence of God and let God chip away those things, break those. Something, I love that song, something's got to break. There's some things in our lives that we've got to break off of us, some bondages we've got to be set free from, some things that we've gotten comfortable in that we've got to say, I'm not going to keep living that way anymore because I believe that freedom is possible. And so I believe that God is calling not just the world, the church, to a place of holiness. I believe that God is calling the church to a place of freedom. And that's what we're talking about here today. And so let's go back to the story, um, Exodus chapter 14. So Pharaoh drew near, and this is the people's response. And you're going to see this, these, there's three things we're going to see three times in this story. When, pa when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel says they lifted their eyes. They saw the enemy coming. 
They could see him. And behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they feared the Egyptians greatly. And the people of Israel, they cried out to God. So they saw the enemy. They feared the enemy. And they cried out to God. And then they said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is it not this what we said to you? Is, is this not what we said to you? This is what we've believed all along. We, we had a feeling that when we got out here, it wasn't going to work. We had a feeling that this was too good to be true. We, we didn't really believe that, that, that freedom was really possible. We, we believed that this might happen. So they saw something. They feared something. They believed something. that says, leave us alone. This is their response. Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. This is the scripture and the point of the story that breaks my heart. After all that they've seen God do, they said, because I don't have control, because I can't see ahead, and I have no idea how this is going to work, I would rather have some form of control and stay enslaved then I would step out in faith into the unknown where I have no control. So instead of surrendering to God and his will and his sovereignty and maybe not having all the answers, but trusting that he is God and that he is God alone and he is the Lord of the universe, I would rather just be comfortable in my slavery. I would rather make camp. I would rather make camp in my bondages. I would rather say that I, there's promises up there, but because I don't know how we'll get there, because there's a sea in front of me, it would have been better for us to do what, and I believe the people in this moment, if I could read into this a little bit, I bet the people were talking about surrendering. I bet there was murmurings in the camp of going, if we just put our hands up like this, we could at least go back to what we had. Because the fear of the unknown had paralyzed them. They were stuck in this moment, in this situation. So there's three things I want us to see in this story, and three things I think that's going to help us, and we just saw them there, but I want to show them to you again. And here's three questions I, I believe if we ask these questions, that us as believers, we can walk in freedom. I believe that if we ask these questions and we can, we can reposition our thinking and reposition our hearts, I believe that we can walk in freedom, and the promises of God are obtainable. They're not just far-fetched. Yeah, there might be some obstacles in the way. There might be a journey ahead, but I believe the promises of God are for his people. But I believe we've got to come face to face with these questions. And here's the first question is this, who do you see? It says the Israelites, they're marching, heading out of town, millions of people. There's a Red Sea in front of them. They see a what? But then it says they turned, they lifted their eyes, and they saw Pharaoh and his 600 assassins coming down on them fast and furious. Pun intended. My boy's like that, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't even trying to do that. You're welcome. Um, and so they come coming down. Yeah, you, Jonah, do you like Fast and Furious? You want to watch it? I won't let him watch it. <laughs> uh, so they got these guys. What happens? Well, we see here, that, and I believe this, that what you see is affected by where you look. And it sounds really obvious. But what we see, the potential of what we see is affected by where we look. They took their eyes off of the progress, off of the, the plan, off of the direction that God had them on. And it says that they directed their eyes backwards towards the Egyptians. And church, I believe there's way too many of us that are way too focused about what's going on in our rearview mirror. Uh, we're, we're consumed by it. We, want, we make plans for our future, but all we think about is what we've done. We, we have a hope and a dream for what's up there, and we, we have intentions, and man, we hope that this will work out, but the reality is we spend all of our time thinking about what someone said about us 10 years ago. Maybe what a parent said about us or what a friend said about us. Those words that were spoken keep calling us back to our rearview mirror. We keep looking back. Maybe it's a past mistake, something that we've done. Maybe it's a pattern in our life that's behind us. Maybe it's something that maybe we didn't choose, but maybe it's something that was done to us something that wasn't even our choice, but we continue to look backwards. And I can tell you this, we will never accomplish as, what God has called us to. As long as we're looking behind, we'll never be able to accomplish what God has ahead of us. And we're stuck in this, and, and this is what the people of Israel, they, God had just done the most incredible things that, in fact, humanity has ever seen, and he wasn't done yet. 
as they went through the wilderness, God continued to do some of the most incredible miracles that the Bible has, ever, that the Bible has recorded and the man has ever seen. And it would be easy for us to go, well, if I would have ever seen those miracles, I would never have acted that way. I think it's easy for us to, to have that position, like if I was them, I wouldn't have said that. But yet, don't we live pretty blessed? I mean, and don't, most of us in the room probably have all of our needs met. Probably have food, probably have shelter, probably have clothes. Most of us probably have future plans even to make more money or to save money or to retire or to get a nicer vehicle or to take a vacation. We've got plans that are propelling us forward. And we would sit here and go, well, I've earned those things. I've done those things. But I believe that it's only by the grace and the mercy of God that we have what we have here today. That if, we're, if we would be willing to, we can look at what we have and go, this is a miracle. Because we can look across the world and go, not everyone has this. Not everyone's been given these opportunities. Not everyone is in a room like this getting to hear preaching and worship like this. Some people are hiding in their basements dealing with pages of paper, Bible that they've ripped out. I, I believe it's the grace of God. I believe, in fact, we live in a miracle. I believe I'm living in a miracle and you're living in a miracle. So for us to say I would never do that, I think we have to put it in our perspective and in our culture and our time and go, have I ever cried out to God and say, why in my situation? Even though I've received these miracles and these blessings, have I ever asked God why? We are these people. It may not be the same, so before we start judging them and start trying to separate ourselves from them and say, well, if I'd ever seen God do some of those crazy things, I would never have asked that question. Man, God sent Jesus to this earth to die on a cross. That's the best and greatest miracle that's ever been done for all of humanity, yet we still ask why sometimes. So I don't want to guilt you in asking why, but I think it's important for us to, to recognize the who that we see is important. When the Israelites saw Pharaoh coming, it paralyzed them. They stopped. They didn't keep moving forward. They were stuck, and they started crying out to God and crying out to Moses. I believe it's important for us to talk about the who that we see because I believe the who that we see is very important for us in terms of, uh, of recognizing that it's not just a what, sometimes it's a who. That when we, we can look about the situations, the, 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 the things that happen in our lives, and it's really easy for us to blame our society. Really easy for us to blame our upbringing. It can be really easy for us to blame our decisions. Not recognizing that we have an enemy that's seeking to devour. So who do you see? When you look around at your problems and your mistakes and, and your bondages, the things that may be keeping you from the promise of God, are you looking at who's or are you just looking at what's? Are you just looking at what's been done or what you could do better? Or do you recognize that we are actually in some, something a, a, like a spiritual battle, if there's a spiritual warfare that's happening on, and there's actually an enemy that's actually out to get us? And in fact, Paul says it this way in Ephesians, it says that we battle not against flesh and blood, meaning that we're not in battle with each other, but our real battle is against evil principalities and darknesses, that, talking about Satan. And so I think too, maybe, maybe we can put too much into or too much hope into our next plan or our, our next hopes or our, our, our next strategy to reach the next level or a next like, strategy to be free from this, or maybe even put too much hope in politicians, or put too much hope in doctors, or put too much hope in, I'm not saying all those people are bad, but we, if we're not careful, we can put too much on them and not recognize there's actually a who in a situation that's maybe beyond what we can see that's happening in the spiritual. Jesus, or excuse me, God, in this moment, in this, in this story, had done so many miracles Yet all they could focus on what was behind them. Here's the second question. Who do you fear? Who do you see? Do we see that God is at work? Do we see that God is in moving? Or do we see that there's an enemy out to get us? And who do you fear? It says that they feared greatly when they saw the Egyptians. And here's what happened. The Egyptians had quickly forgotten the miracles of God's wrath. Had they not forgotten the miracles of God's wrath, they would not have gotten in their buggies and chased those Israelites because they wouldn't have known what was coming their way. How quickly they forgot God's wrath. Their, all their firstborn was just gone. Their crops destroyed, their livestock destroyed. I mean, their entire way of life was destroyed, and yet they're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lift my sword against God and his people. How quickly they forgot God's wrath. 
But in the story, not only did they forget something, we see that the people of Israel forgot the, the miracle of God's mercy. How quickly did they start crying out to God and say, God, how are we going to get out of this? God, what, it would have been better if we had stayed. How quickly did, did they forget and how quickly did they forget? In fact, Psalms 38, 33 says this, let all of the earth fear the Lord. Let all of the earth fear the Lord. Fear, fear of the Lord. That's something that's not talked about, I think, probably often enough in the church today, is the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. You mean I'm supposed to fear God? Like, I thought God was nice. Like, Jesus came down to the earth, and like, he walked with normal people. He, he healed people who were sick. He hung out and talked to the prostitutes and, and ministered to them. He, he hung out and talked to tax collectors and ministered to them. Like, he, he fed thousands of people and healed thousands of people. In fact, Luke tells us the Bible, there's not enough pages that can contain all of the miracles that he did. I thought, I thought Jesus was nice. Like, I, I, you know, and, and so why would we fear someone that's nice? And then so you could get into this, well, like, well, we look at the Old Testament and God wasn't nice. And we look at the New Testament and God is nice. And if we're not careful, we can start to separate those two diff as almost being two entities, two different people of God. And I believe it, what it does, it really gives us a full picture of who God is. Last week we talked about this, that, that the love of God and the wrath of God coexist. They're not separate people. They're not New Testament versus Old Testament. In fact, there's a, 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 a cultural phenomenon right now out there called the woke gospel, where people are just wanting to take just pieces of what Jesus said, and that's it. Erase the rest of the Bible. Let's just take the parts of it that we like. And so if we're not careful, we start pulling to the love side, and we start walking away from the wrath side. And we talked about this last week, that as a dad, I can show you that love and wrath can coexist because I love my kids. And if you come up against my kids, you're going to deal with my wrath. I, once I had a daughter, like, I recognized, like, and I said this last week, my joke last week, I went and bought another gun. Like, I, like, I got a daughter now. I got to protect that little girl. Like, there's something inside of you that stands up for your family. Like, you, you want to protect them. But then also, on the flip side, I've got teenagers. And I love them, but the wrath comes down many times in my house, sometimes multiple times an hour. Those two things are not separate from each other. They coexist. I can love someone and I can come down on them. In fact, it says this in Scripture, that those who God loves, he, he chastises or he corrects or he disciplines. So we see that the love of God and the wrath of God coexist. But here's what the world wants us to do with our gospel. Here's what the world wants us to do with the word of God. They want us to separate the love and the wrath. They don't, they don't, want, us, they don't want to believe that a God who loves can also have wrath. Because they want us to, to love everything, and to, to, and to love means this, not just to love, but it means I, I affirm everything that you believe. Because if I disagree with you, if I come over here and say, hey, this is what God's word says, and even though I might not like all of it, I believe it, well, then that must mean I hate you. And that's not true. In fact, I believe that God's word shows us over and over and over again that we can dislike or we can disagree with people and not dislike them. In fact, I believe that's the fullest picture of the gospel. In fact, I believe that's what Jesus showed us. That when Jesus went and spent time with sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors, he wasn't affirming their beliefs. He wasn't affirming their lifestyles. Jesus was actually loving them, and in his love for them, he actually showed them that there was a different way to live. In fact, in every one of those situations just about Jesus, one of the last things he said in those moments was this, go and sin no more. He maybe didn't start that way, but he sure finished that way. Why did he finish that way? Because he wanted them to experience freedom. That was part of the salvation plan was that I'm going to turn from who I was and be who God's called me to be. See, I believe that these things, what the world is trying to divide, if you're not for me, you're against me, it's just, it's not true. In fact, I can disagree with you and still be for you. I can still love you. I can still care for you. I, in fact, I hope this place is full of people that disagree with me every week. I want this to be a safe place to ask questions. I want this to be a safe place to go, I'm not quite sure about all this God stuff, but I, I want to know a little bit more. And is it okay to have questions? I sure hope so, because I've got questions. I open God's word and I go, God, show me, teach me. God, help me to surrender to you, to your will, to your way. When I open God's word, I don't automatically agree with everything. There's, when I open God's word, sometimes it has to cut away at me, it has to break away at me. 
And so who do we fear? When we talk about this question, we think the fear of God means we're scared of him. And I think that last song we were singing, uh, uh, Holy, Holy Ground, and it says this, chains fall, fear bow. Every time I've sang that, I've always sang it as if, if I'm scared, I shouldn't be scared anymore. It's not what it says. It says fear bow. I don't think I'm telling fear to bow. I think, I think another way to look at this is because I fear God, I bow. Because I recognize how good God is, that he is all powerful. What I say is I surrender to you. What I say is, God, you are worthy. I am not. I am not in control. When I go right here to my knees, what I'm saying is I'm not in charge anymore. I've surrendered my will. I've surrendered my way. Why? Because I fear you. Not because I'm scared, but because I understand you're God. You're powerful. And I trust you. I believe you. I fear for you. I surrender my life to you. But what happens is we can't, sur- we can't, we can't be fearful of someone or we can't surrender to someone we're not fearful of. If we don't have a true sense of the fear of God in our lives, recognize that he is God and I am not, then what happens is can you be God and, and me be God too? That's the question then, that's the, that's the perplexity of our current culture. It's like, yeah, believe in your God, but also what's my truth? What do I believe? How does that make me feel? Well, I'm telling you this, if we have a true sense of who God is, we begin and we find ourselves in constant surrender. And what that does is it doesn't build weak people. What it does is it builds meek people. When you're, the, when you're weak, you bow to everything, to culture. And, and maybe you do just start to affirming everything and let's just all get along. But when you're meek, you can say, man, I surrender to God, but I also believe this. And I believe that's what we're, we're praying for. That's what I'm praying for, for the people that are facing adversity in Afghanistan. That God, you help them to be meek and surrender to you, but also have boldness to stand for their faith. If it is their final hours, if that, if that is what's happening, God, give them boldness. God, as they surrender to you. It's not one without the other. Those things go together. Being fearful of God is not running away from him. It's bowing down to him. And so we need, we need to have a sense of fear of God. So who do you see is important? Who you fear is important? And then the last one, who do you believe? Who do you believe? So the, one of the things they said is they asked Moses again, is it not what we said to you? Didn't we tell you this would happen? In, that, in essence, what they're saying. Didn't we say when we leave, they're going to come chase us? Didn't we bring this up to you probably in some leadership meeting or some elder meeting or something before they're leaving? Like, hey, what's the, what's the possibility, Moses, they're going to come after us? You know, like, we need to know, like, we, like, we might decide to stay. Like, didn't we have this conversation we didn't really, like, we weren't really sure we believed that we were free. Who do you believe? Who do you believe? In this question, I, I, I believe, uh, I believe in this question, when we ask this question, again, we're referencing a who. We're referencing a who. Who do you believe? If we're referencing a who, then we're also referencing a word, something that's been spoken, a voice. Who do you believe? Do you believe the word of God? Do you believe it? It says, faith comes by hearing the word of God. So are you putting yourself in a place where you get to hear God's word? Are you putting yourself in a place where you get to hear the voice of God? It's going to be really hard to believe something you've not heard. Who do you believe? Well, in this situation, they could hear the chariots. They could hear the the, the rally cries, the army cries. They could probably hear the cursing coming from the mountains as they come. We're going to get you. We're going to blankety-blank you. And these were not good people, not nice people. I'm sure that those were the things that they were hearing. And it wasn't hard for them to lose and forget all the things they believed. They just saw God do all these miracles. Yet in this moment, because there was a Red Sea in front of them and the army behind them, what they heard took dominance over their thoughts. What they heard took dominance over their actions. So they stopped because they could hear and church, I, I believe if we want to be able to have faith to move forward, if, we, if, we are gonna, if God's going to move in our lives and cause us to step forward and step closer to our promise, we're going to have to change some of the things that we're hearing. And if we change some of the things that we're hearing, that might help us change what we believe. And if we keep listening to the voice of the enemy, if we keep looking in our rearview mirrors, if we keep listening to the things that we're listening to, we're going to continue to stay put where we're at. Maybe we're saved. Maybe you believe in Jesus, but you're not walking in freedom. And church, I want you to have freedom. 
I, I want you to walk in not just, not just it, free from the penalty of sin. I want you to walk free from the power of sin over your life. I want you to walk not just free from the power of sin in your life. I want to see you walk in the power of God in your life. I want to see God move in your life. I want to see God move in your marriage. I want to see God move in your relationship with your kids and your families. I want to see God move in your businesses. I want to see God move in this city. But before that can happen, he's got to move in us. We can't ask God to do something out there when he's never done it in here. And so if we're going to claim to be a church that desires to see Wichita experience the real Jesus, we've got to experience him first. We've got to say, God, break me. God, change me. God, help me to leave the former behind. And God, help me to press towards you. God, I see you. I put my focus and my gaze on you. I fix my gaze on you. I'm not going to turn when I hear the voice of the enemy. I'm not going to turn when I hear the chariots. I'm going to stay focused on you. I'm going to keep my attention on you. Even when he reminds me of who I've been and what I've done and where I've come from and what's been done to me, I'm not going to let that drag me back. I'm going to stay focused and fix my gaze on you, Jesus. And I'm not going to only do that, God. I don't just do that, God. I set my fear on you. I fear you, God, because you are God and God alone. You are the one true God. There is no other gods like you. You don't, you don't tussle with these other things. You are God and God alone. You reign supreme. God, I believe you and I trust you. God, I, I see you in the heavens and I trust you. God, I believe that you're the creator of the universe. God, I believe that you're the first and the last. God, I put all my faith in you. God, and I surrender my will to you. And God, I believe that if you said I can get through it, I'm going to get through it. I may not see how there may be an obstacle in front of me and an enemy behind me, but if you said I'll walk on water, you'll split the seas, you'll form a boat. I don't know what you're going to do, God, but I'm going to keep moving forward. But too many times we've let those voices and all those things continue to just pull us back or maybe at best paralyze us where we are. And the promise of God is ahead. The blessing of God is ahead. The purpose of God is ahead. But who you see matters. Who you fear matters. And who you believe matters. It's a who, not just a what. It's a relationship. It's a person. It's someone you can know, not just something you learn. God is calling us to him. Exodus 5, verse 2. The question that Pharaoh had, the question Pharaoh asked, is who is the Lord? That's a relational, that's a personal question. Who is this person? And I will tell you, he is Lord, and you can know him. Let's read the end of this story today. Exodus 14, it says, And Moses said to the people, Fear not. Fear. Stand firm. Believe. Have courage. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians who you seem today, you'll never see again. Some of these things that you've been dealing with and you thought you just had to deal with, you can get rid of them. God can set you free from them. It can be a new day and you can never deal with them again. I believe the freedom that God had right here in this story, God has for us in our lives today. That God can set us free. So let's keep reading. The Lord will fight for you. All you have to do is be silent. Stop your whining. <laughs> Stop your complaining. Hey. We have a soft view of God. We, we worry about politics. We worry about money. We worry about, about what people think about us. We worry about sicknesses and disease. How often do we consider or worry, and not worry, but maybe fear the Lord? We've elevated these other things in our lives, and God's over here. Do you trust me? Do you trust that I am God over all? And it's, be silent. Stop doing all that stuff. Come, worship me. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Just keep walking. Do you believe trust? Just start moving towards the water. Lift up your staff, so he tells Moses. Stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get the glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. These assassins have nothing on your God. And Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I've gotten glory over, his Pharaoh, over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. I'm going to jump. So Pharaoh, Moses does this. Lifts up a staff. Water split. Israelites walk through on dry ground. They're standing on the other side. And Moses lifts up a staff again, and the seas collapse. 
It says, thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. They saw the Lord. They saw how he moved. So the people, now the Israelites, they feared the Lord. And then they believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. They went from seeing their enemy, fearing their enemy, believing the lies that were in their heads, to now seeing the Lord, fearing the Lord, and believing the Lord. I believe that, that that's the thing, that's, that's, the, that's the moment, that's the breakthrough that many of us have, is that we've wanted breakthrough in our lives, but we've made it too much about the what and not enough about the who. We, we've tried different things, we've tried different systems, we've tried different plans, we've read different books, we've listened to different podcasts, but we've not yet asked ourselves the question, who is the Lord? Pharaoh asked that question, who is the Lord? And God showed us, if you just read through this, if you weren't here the last few weeks, the Lord is powerful, the Lord is strong, the Lord is mighty, the Lord is calling those to repent and to follow him. The Lord is merciful, giving chance after chance after chance after chance after chance to the Egyptians to turn from their ways and to worship him, the one true God. That is who our Lord is. Pharaoh asked, who is the Lord? The Lord is this. We see it. Do you see it? Do you fear him? Do you believe that he is God of the universe?